Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 15, the Gospel of John chapter 15. In this series, uh, we've considered the seven deadly sins of pride, of envy, of anger, of sloth, of gluttony, and greed and lust. These sins, like all sins, are deadly. The Bible says the wages of sin is death. Uh, we must acknowledge that we as individuals have committed these sins. We are to repent of them. We are to name them, as it were, before the Lord, and then trust in our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, yes, for these sins. Not only dying, but being buried, being raised from the dead. And we believe that salvation and cleansing of these sins is found in Christ and in Christ alone. Paul writes, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And it is by grace that we are saved through faith. That's not our own doing. It's a gift of God, not a result of works, lest anyone should boast. That is, you cannot work for your salvation. You cannot atone for your sins. You cannot wipe out and deal with these sins in your life. No, we need a Savior. We need to understand that salvation is not based on what we do, not on our personal achievements, not on coming to church, not on being baptized, not on our spiritual heritage, but rather personally trusting the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And if you've never received Christ as your Savior, I plead with you to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Now, the wonderful thing is that the grace of God which saves us transforms us. Supernatural transformation takes place once we place our faith in Jesus Christ. We receive the gift of salvation. We also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit who indwells us. And yes, things are different then. Paul says, Christ lives in me. And now, as a follower of Jesus, instead of being characterized by these works of the flesh, there is displayed in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. So, in this final message in the series, The Seven Deadly Sins, I thought we should look at a fruitful life. No longer wretched sinners, but fruitful disciples. So, here in John chapter 15, we read that Jesus says, I am the true vine. He makes seven statements, I am, and uh, this is the final one. This metaphor of the vine is mentioned many times in the Old Testament, particularly in Isaiah chapter 5, but we're going to read now the first 17 verses of John chapter 15, a wonderful passage. Here is the Word of God to you and to me this morning. Jesus is speaking. He's in the upper room. He's about to go to the cross, and He's giving this very important teaching, this deep teaching to His disciples prior to His death on the cross. He says here, chapter 15, verse 1, I am the true vine, and my Father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, He takes away, and every branch that does bear fruit, He prunes, that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I have spoken to you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me, and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. If anyone does not abide in me, He's thrown away like a branch and withers, and the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire, and burned. If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love." If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. 
These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what the master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my Father, I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you, and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit, and that your fruit should abide, so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you, so that you will love one another. An astonishing passage of Scripture that is so, so rich. I want to say a few observations on this passage as we think of the fruitful life. And surely, if you're a follower of Jesus, you want your life to count. You want your life to be fruitful. First of all, the fruitful life is united with Christ. This is foundational. We must grasp this. Authentic followers of Jesus Christ are united to Christ. That is, salvation is a personal relationship with Christ. John chapter 14, verse 20, Jesus says, In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. What an extraordinary statement. Do you grasp it? You in me, and I in you. And now he explains this further, as we see in verse 5, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me you can do nothing. We understand this. A branch apart from the vine will never bear grapes, will never bear fruit. The life of the branch comes not from itself, but from the vine. So our spiritual life does not come from ourselves. It's not self-generated. It's not something that we would do. It comes supernaturally from Jesus Christ. He's the vine. We are His branches. And true followers of Jesus Christ, then, are personally united to Christ. This believing that we stress, this faith, is not just believing about Christ. It's not just trying to imitate Christ. It's not just trying to follow the teaching of Christ, but rather it is believing in Christ. In fact, the writers of the New Testament, when they talk about believing in Jesus Christ, often talk about believing into Jesus Christ. In English, that perhaps doesn't make much sense, but there's a little Greek word, into. We have it in John 3.16, for God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him, literally into Him, will not perish but have everlasting life. Similarly, in John 3.36, whoever believes, our translation says, in the Son, literally, whoever believes into the Son has eternal life. I want you to grasp this. This salvation, this life of fruitfulness, is a vital, dynamic, living relationship and union with our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for our sins, who rose again, and is eternally alive. We are united with Christ. I understand it's difficult to grasp this. We, we are in Him, and He is in us. Just about every month we have a baptismal service here at Calvary. We rejoice in that. And water baptism pictures and symbolizes this union with Christ. When we're baptized, we are literally being baptized into His name. Matthew 18, Matthew 28, that we're to go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them again into the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Do you, do you capture the intimacy, the union, that we share the life of Christ? He is alive forevermore. So our union with the Lord Jesus Christ is irreversible. I am in Him, and He is in me. I am 
forever, yes, forever united with my Lord Jesus Christ because he is alive forevermore. I have been united to him in his death, in his burial, and in his glorious resurrection. Paul says in, in Romans 6, I'm to walk in newness of life. I'm baptized into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I've had a change of name. I've had a change of identity now that I'm a follower of Christ. And we are to live then in a way which is consistent with that change of identity and with that change of name. Before Goodney and I married, she had the incredible name of Goodney Ingalls Daughters Gunnarsson. Took me ages to even say it. There was a day that we got married, and she had a change of name. She's no longer known as Goodney Ingalls Daughter Gunnarsson. She's known as Goodney Monroe. Not only did she have a change of name, a change of identity, she had a change of life. As she moved from Scandinavia and came to Scotland, there's a different culture. Uh, we do things differently in Scotland. We do it the right way, and she had to learn that. <laughs> she had to learn a new language. English was her third language. Change of identity, a change of lifestyle. Some of you understand that in marriage and life. You've gone through something like this. But being a follower of Jesus Christ is more radical. You are united with Christ. You're different. You're to live differently. You cannot go back to that old lifestyle. You are to continue to abide in Christ. See, the grace of God is tremendous. It produces this change of our identity and the change of lifestyle. And this union with Christ is foundational, I want you to grasp it, is foundational to our spiritual life. Believing into Christ means that I'm trusting Christ, and I'm drawing on all of the resources of my Lord Jesus Christ. All of His resources are available to us. We're blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies, Paul says. You say, what about sin? Is it gone? No. These seven deadly sins are still there. But what has changed, and this is radical, the power of sin over the Christian is now broken. The reign of sin in the life of the Christian is now broken by my Lord Jesus Christ, that I am united with Him, that when He went into death and as He rose from the dead, He defeated sin. He broke the power of sin in our lives. Now, sin is still there. I can still choose to sin. But I have now, as I abide in Christ, as I draw from the true vine, I realize there is a stronger power, a supernatural power, the power of the Holy Spirit. And as we sang, did you grasp it? I am His, and He is mine. It's not wonderful being a Christian. It's not wonderful being a follower of Jesus Christ. Now, this supernatural life produces fruit. Those who abide in Christ and Christ abiding in them bear much fruit. Now, however gifted you are, however hardworking, however educated, however disciplined you are, by yourself, please get this, you will never ever bear spiritual fruit. Isn't that what Jesus says in verse 5? Apart from me, how much can you do? Nothing. Oh, that doesn't mean literally there's nothing that we can do. The point is nothing for God. No spiritual fruit. There can be activity, there can be pretense, there can be ceremonies, there can be church, but in terms of spiritual fruit, there is zero. And it's vital that we grasp this. As we go through life, that we are consciously depending on the true vine. And one of the marks then of the true Christian 
is that there's supernatural fruit is being displayed. Here is a tree. There's a sign on it, apple tree. But it doesn't bear any apples. In fact, it's not an apple tree at all. Someone has put a sign, apple tree. Now, how do we know there's an apple tree? It bears apples. You can put the sign on, I'm a Christian. You can come to Calvary Church and say, I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. You have that sign. Does that make you a follower of Christ? Absolutely not. The Scripture warns us there are false professors. There are people who honor God with their lips, but their hearts are far from them. No, we are to be known, says Jesus, by our fruit. Now, we don't become disciples by bearing fruit, but because we are His disciples, we do bear fruit. What do unbelievers display? They display these deadly sins, the works of the flesh. This is how Paul puts it in Galatians 5, 19, now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envies, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. What a terrible list. He says, I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit… Let me read the list. Ask yourself, is there any of this in me? I don't mean perfect, but is there a display of love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Did you notice verse 8? Galatians 15, uh, sorry, John 15, verse 8, by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Oh, I know it's an apple tree because there's apples, not because there's a sign. But like I can partake of the apple and taste it and say, that's an apple. And this wonderful fruit is displayed in the lives of those who are united with Christ, those who are in the true vine. Now, secondly, this fruitful life is pruned by the Father. Verse 1, I'm the true vine, and my Father, God the Father, is the vine dresser. He is the gardener. I've never grown grapes, but I understand that the vines have to be pruned from time to time. And if there is a branch that is not bearing fruit, that branch is taken away. Of course, the whole point of the branch is to bear fruit. If it's not going to bear fruit, it's to be cut off and it's going to be burned. It's useless. So the unfruitful branch is removed by the vine dresser, taken away. Jesus knew about the false branches, didn't he? He had a man who had followed him for 12 years. His name was Judas. And Judas is going to be taken away. In the upper room, Jesus had washed the feet of Judas, such was his, his love for this man. But he was a false professor. He was not an authentic follower of Jesus Christ. He's taken away. But did you notice in verse 2? Every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Some of you are gardeners, and you know that. You have to prune the tree. You have to prune the bush, not to hurt the bush, but so that it is more fruitful. And this is what our Heavenly Father does in our Christian life. He prunes us. That can be very painful, can't it? Have you ever been under the pruning knife of your Heavenly Father? It's painful, but it is very necessary. In our Heavenly Father's infinite wisdom, He prunes from our life that which would hinder our spiritual growth. 
Is his goal to hurt you? No. He loves you. His goal is that you will bear more fruit. You see, what is this fruit? Let me say this. It's becoming more and more like Jesus. That's the fruit of the Spirit. That's what it means to be a holy person, is to be like Jesus. And as you live your life, there are these sins, these attitudes, behavior, thoughts, lifestyle, which begin to creep into your life. And it means you're not as fruitful as you should be, and your heavenly Father comes, and He prunes you so that you're more and more like Jesus. You know what it is. I've been under the, the pruning knife. You know what it is. Painful, as I say, but necessary. Amy, Amy Carmichael prayed, rid me, good Lord, of every diverting thing. You've got to be careful to pray that prayer, right? Rid me, good Lord, of every diverting thing. The prayer, Lord, to take away anything in my life which is hindering my fruitfulness. Would you, would you be ready to pray that? The pruning knife. So when difficult circumstances, disappointments, life doesn't go as planned, things come into your life and your family and your business and your own personal life, which are hard, painful, don't think that your heavenly Father is angry. He's not angry with you. He's seeking to prune you. He's not seeking to punish you. He wants you to be more and more fruitful. And Jesus never, never throws away authentic branches and casts them away. You say, is this passage saying that I can lose my salvation if I'm not fruitful enough? No, that's not what the passage is saying at all. Jesus has given teaching about eternal security in passages such as, as John 10. And He says in John 6, verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. If you have come in true repentance to the Savior, and your trust is in Jesus Christ, however stumbling your life may be, and however disappointing it will be, the Savior will never cut you off, will never sever you. But pruning and discipline happens. So first, the fruitful life is united with Christ. Secondly, the fruitful life is pruned by the Father. Third, and this is so important, the fruitful life is nourished by His Word. That is, fruitful Christians are obedient Christians. This is where it gets very convicting, doesn't it? Notice verses 7 and 8 again. John chapter 15, verse 7. If you abide in Me, and My words abide in you. Do you notice this? Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified, that you bear much fruit, and so prove to me my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so, ha so have I loved you. Abide in my love. Notice this, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. Fruitful Christians are obedient Christians. You know. If you love someone, you seek to please them. If you have a friend that you say you love, you don't disregard her wishes, her interests, her opinions. If you did that, we would question your love. No, one of the, the marks of love is that you seek to please the person. Jesus is saying, one of the characteristics, if you love me, is that you'll keep my commandments. And in that way, we abide in His love. You sometimes feel, you wonder if God still loves you. Could it be that you are disobedient? Turn back to chapter 8, John chapter 8. Well-known verses to some of you. John 8, verse 31.
Jesus said to the Jews who had believed him, if you abide in my word, you're truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How do you know you're a true disciple? Abiding in His Word. That is absolutely essential. As a follower of Jesus Christ, we are to be obedient, and that means we are to know the Word of God and obey it. Why? Because we have a master deceiver. He seeks with his lies, his illusions, to make us his slaves. Jesus calls him in John 8, the father of lies. And the devil wants you to continue in these deadly sins and other sins. He wants to have the hold on you. He wants to control you. He wants to reduce the fruitfulness of your life. What must I do then? I must be nourished by the Word of God. How do we begin the Christian life? By hearing the Word of God and believing it. Truly, truly, says Jesus, I say to you, whoever hears my word and believes it has everlasting life. This is what it means to be a Christian, is to hear the Word of God, is to hear the gospel, and to respond to that and so become a follower of Jesus Christ. But this is to characterize my life, that the Christian is constantly being nourished by the Word of God. It's abiding in the Word of God, which is truth, and I must hear the Word of God, and I must obey the Word of God. This is why it's so important that you come as you've come today to hear the preaching of the Word of God. That's why it's so important that you're in the Scriptures. This abiding, then, is being immersed in, rooted in, and nourished by the Word. John chapter 14, verse 23. Here's again the Lord Jesus. If anyone loves me, he will keep my word. That couldn't be clearer. If you love Jesus Christ, you will keep His word, and my Father will love Him, and we will come to Him and make our home with Him. How wonderful. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words. And every stage of discipleship, of following Jesus, is dependent on the Word of God. I am daily to listen to Jesus and obey Him. And this Christian life, then, produces fruitfulness, which is the very character of Jesus and His likeness. So, I have to ask you. Some of you are here, and if you're honest, you would acknowledge that your spiritual life is stale. It's, it, it's, it's withering. Isn't that right? It should be fresh. It should be vibrant. It should be fruitful. If you know your Bible, as I say this, you're thinking of Psalm number one, the doorkeeper of the Psalter. Psalm one, listen to it, about this man who's blessed by God. You want to be blessed by God? His delight is in the law of the Lord and on his law he meditates day and night. He has a love for the Word of God. He delights in the Word of God. It's not a chore. He's like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. That's it. The fruitful life is being nourished by the Word of God. You are to draw from the inexhaustible true vine every day. You are to read your Bible. You say, well, I go, I have a little group, and I meet with them, and we study the Bible. You know, a lot of these little Bible study groups, obviously I think people should study the Bible, but sometimes they're not really studying the Bible. They're talking about the Bible. Uh, they, they are studying some book, and there is nothing like actually reading the Word of God. Go to your Bible study, of course. Go to the life group, of course. Come and hear preaching at Calvary, but I want you to do something else, and some of you are not doing it. I want you to take this book, not some other devotional guide. They can be helpful. The Word of God, get a, a, a quiet place, 
We used to call it having our quiet time. I grew up. We'd be asked, have you had your quiet time? That means, have you had your time in the Word of God and in prayer? It's difficult to get a quiet place. We live in a noisy place. If you're a young mother with a lot of children, it's difficult to do this. I understand. But I want you to do it and to open your Bible and ask God to teach you. The psalmist in Psalm 119 is always saying to, the, to God, teach me, teach me, teach me. You've got the Holy Spirit. He will teach you. And you say, John, I do that, and I don't get all that much from it. I plead guilty to that as well. Sometimes I read the Bible, and I think I really didn't get much from it. But did you notice verse 3? Already you are clean because of the Word that I have spoken to you. This book, like no other book, will keep you clean. If you ask me, what did you have for dinner last Monday night? I don't know what it was, but I know it was good, and I know it nourished me. And if I said to you, what did you read in your Bible a week ago? You might not remember, but one thing I guarantee, if you read it with a humble heart, asking the Spirit to teach you, it has a cleansing effect. It has a supernatural effect in your life. And so you're reading the Bible. Of course, we want to learn. We want to understand. But even when we don't understand everything that we're reading, we're being nourished by it, and we're being cleansed by it. Here, someone on Monday gave me this flower, and there it is. It's in my office. And this thing has grown incredible this past week. I couldn't believe it. And there's a picture of it. And the instruction says, it's in water. You've got to keep apparently 75% of water. And it said also it needs light. So I've made sure uh, it's got plenty of water. Uh, I have it by the window. It's got pre plenty of light. And this thing is growing. Now, at some point, it's going to die. I, I realize that. But notice, the roots are in the water. It's being nourished by the water. It's growing with the light of the sun and water. And if I took it out of the water, it's going to die. And some of you are struggling spiritually because unlike the psalmist, you don't have roots in the Word of God. You need to be constantly nourished by the Word of God. I do. I read the Bible. Yes, I have to study in order to preach and to teach. But apart from that, I'm reading the Word of God. You're to do that. Children, you can do it. A few verses. You don't need to read a whole book. It's amazing how much you could read in half an hour. You say, I don't have time. Listen, you spent about two or three hours last night watching some ball game. And apparently somebody won and somebody lost. That always happens. And you spent hours, and you're telling me you can't spend 30, 30 minutes in this. You can spend a lot of time working out. You can spend a lot of time doing all kinds of things. This is to be a priority so that I am fruitful, so that you're fruitful. And Jesus is telling this, the fruitful life is nourished by the Word. If you are not obeying the Word of God, you will not be fruitful. You will not be growing. Here's the final one. The fruitful life is loving life, is loving. Fruitful life, first, is united with Christ. Secondly, it's pruned by the Father. Third, it's nourished by His Word. Finally, the fruitful life is loving. Again, verse 9 of John 15, as the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in His love. These things I've spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full. This is the way of joy. This is the way of peace. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Verse 17, these things I command you to do what? That you will love one another. What is the overarching, distinguishing feature 
of the fruitful life of the Christian. One word, love. These disciples knew that they were loved by Jesus. The beginning of the upper room ministry in John chapter 13, before He washed His disciples' feet, we read, John writes, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the uttermost. He loved them to the end. And it's very interesting that John, who is recording this from John 13 to the end of John's gospel, John 21, do you know how he refers to himself? The disciple whom Jesus loved. Now, Jesus loved all of the disciples. He washed all of their feet. He loved them to the end. But here is a man who understands an amazing thing, that in terms of his relationship with Jesus, he describes himself as the disciple whom Jesus loved. First occurrences in chapter 13, verse 22, and as you read the rest of the gospel, frequently he refers to this. Does it mean that Peter and Andrew and Philip didn't love Jesus? No. But John understood this. I am loved by God. Can I humbly say, my name is John, and I'm also a disciple whom Jesus loves. We were taught in Sunday school, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. What a Savior. The disciples were going to leave Him. Judas was going to betray Him. John, uh, Peter was going to deny Him, and still He loves Him. This love is not a temporary, casual, conditional love. No, this is not a love of convenience. This is a revelation of the very heart of God. But as I come to Christ, and as I abide in the vine, I can say, and you can say, I am a disciple whom Jesus loved. We sang that old hymn, I trust you followed it, loved with everlasting love. In a love which cannot cease, I'm His and He is mine. Doesn't that sustain you? I don't look on myself as a wretched sinner. I do sin. No, I'm a disciple whom Jesus loved. And His love will never end. Human love goes up and down. Human love sometimes comes to an end, but this is an everlasting love. We are people of love. We have received this love. Now Jesus is commanding us to love one another. John is going to say that in 1 John, beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. And that command to love Christ and to love others is repeated over and over again in Scripture in all kinds of way. This is a self-sacrificial love, a love that washes the feet of others, a love that goes the second mile, a love that considers the interests of others before our own selfish needs. And this love is a powerful apologetic to unbelievers. Tertullian reports the pagans of the day saying of Christians, see how they love one another. Wouldn't that be incredible if Calvary Church, people said, you know, they're a bit odd. I've got a really odd pastor and some really odd people in the congregation. But this we do know. They really love one another. Many of you, we heard some in the newcomers' reception last week come and say when they came to this church, they felt the love of God. I trust you feel that. I trust you have experienced it as you come to Calvary Church. And this love that we have for one another goes out, isn't it? Goes out to orphans. It goes out to the needy. It goes out to the poor. It goes out beyond the walls and the campus of Calvary Church. This is the fruit of the Spirit. And notice Jesus said it's a command. Chapter 15, 17, these things I command you so that you'll love one another. Are you a loving person? 
Why is it sometimes we're so harsh? Why is it sometimes we're so critical? Why is it sometimes we won't give someone the benefit of a doubt and we're so quick to judge them and to hammer them? Let's not be like that, brothers and sisters. As we abide in the vine and draw on that wonderful power and wisdom, we will display the love of God. My challenge as I close is twofold. First, are you, uni are you united to Christ? Let me ask you, do you have a living, dynamic, personal relationship with Jesus Christ? If not, I urge you to believe in Him, to trust Him. He loves you. Bore your sins on the cross, rose again, call out, and He will save you and transform you. If you are, brothers, sisters, I'm asking, is there much fruit in your life? Is there that love, that joy, that peace, that self-control? Not so much what you're doing, but who you are. Are you being nourished by the Word? Are you loving others? Are you displaying the fruit of the Spirit? Over these weeks, we spent a lot of time on these deadly sins, and these sins will damn you for all of eternity if you don't know Christ. I want to point you to our beautiful Savior who came in love to die for sinners. And you can enter into a life, a new life, not leading to death, but leading to life eternal, a fruitful life, a life of joy, a life of peace as you trust in Christ. It's not all about us. It's not I, but Christ who lives in me. Father, help us as we abide in the vine. May we daily draw from the infinite resources of the true vine and help us to obey You. Help us to display Christ. We thank You for the Spirit who indwells us. And I plead, Father, for those who are unsaved, may they come to the Savior even now. In Christ's name, amen.